Welcome to the GCN Tech Show. This week, we have to discuss Giro's massive helmet that has taken the internet by storm. We're also going to be looking at some of the tech that helped Tadej Pogacar in his greatest solo victory ever at Strada Bianchi. Also in hot tech, we've got two new bikes to talk about, some new power meter pedals, and we are going to wade in just a little bit on the hookless failure that was spotted in pro racing. Okay, right, this week I'm back from holiday, so um, sorry to everybody that loved having John Canning's back. It's good to have you back, It's man. good news for the five people that missed me. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm one so, of them. Oh, good. <laughs> Six. So this week we're talking on a question that we posed before, and that is, has Cycling Tech gone too far? Now, the reason we're talking about this is because of the fairly wild-looking time trial helmet that Visma Lisa bike are using. Yeah, they unveiled this at the uh, opening stage time trial of Terreno Adriatico, and, well, the internet kind of broke. <laughs> Everyone went wild over it, yeah. because it's massive. Um, <laughs> it's notably huge and everything else, but what are, your, what are your first impressions on this? What are your thoughts? Well, my initial thoughts, uh, I have written in my little notes here, and I don't think I can read them out. Let's just say I'm maybe not a huge fan <laughs> of the design and the looks of it. But I don't, I'm, in no way do I want to question like the credibility of like the aerodynamics or the purpose of it. Purely based on looks, it's a no for me, I think. Yeah, the thing is, right, is that like style and all this stuff, it's all very subjective. Yeah. And we have seen this kind of thing before. Now I'm not, yeah. I'm not, I, just hear me out, <laughs> okay, so, you know, you look at, say, when Specialized launched their current time trial helmet last yeah. year and with the head condom, yeah. and, you know, everyone went mental at that. No, I don't think it got as big a response as this one, but it did get a big response and people looked, looked ridiculous. Before that, we had the POC Tempo, which yeah. everyone deemed too ugly to wear, and then people started winning in it a few years. They even stopped making it, and then people st started winning in older ones that were made before. Um, yeah. You know, it was popularised by, by Dan Bigham and, and everyone changed various their track then, riders. Everyone they? And then they started making it again, and everyone... It it's kind of almost looks normal now, to a cyclist, anyway. So, I don't know, maybe... In a, at the moment, the shock of seeing it, maybe, yeah. in, in, a, in you know, give it a year and we'll be like, mm. That's just going to be run of the mill. Normal, yeah. normal time trial stuff now. But this is the thing, right? We exist in a bubble of cycling. Yeah. And this looks wild to us. Like, it does look crazy. I mean, I've, I've seen all sorts yeah. of crazy little comments on I've seen social me media. Memes literally everywhere. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, the, the two big dominant comparisons people are making are xenomorphs from Aliens yeah. and space balls as well All right. in popular culture. But w w to find out what non-cyclists think of this... Like real people. ...outside of our cycling <laughs> bubble, uh, well, we, we sent some cameras out onto the mean streets of Bath in Somerset to get some real people's thoughts. <laughs> but that's not all. Cycling itself is quite weird. We wear lycra and weird outfits that to most <laughs> yeah. people is a bit alienating and doesn't look especially cool probably. So... We also gave them a baseline of not a rider in that TT helmet, but someone that is just a, a really cool cyclist. Who is it? It be literally better not be a picture of you. Oh. Like my heart sings. Athletic is probably Athletic. the best. Um, and then the next one is uh, this guy. I can't help, I, the first thing that came to my head was banana. What's the first thing that comes to your head when you see this photo. Um, athletic. And then this photo. Oh, uh, speedy. Speedy, okay. Uh, he looks a bit goofy. Yeah. I'd probably say, get out of the way, or something like that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, and uh, this is the next one. Um, would you wear this out, do you think, ever? Nah. No, definitely no, no, not. No, no, no. not um, what would you think of the sort of person that would? Uh, I don't know, someone who likes to dress up yeah. in funny outfits, probably. God, I'm exhausted. <laughs> exhausted? Brilliant! <laughs> and then this guy. Banana head. A lot of, a lot of bananas <laughs> there. I think the, the colours impacting people too much on that when they're yeah, on the spot. Yeah. Um, but <clears throat> the thing is with cycling is, I do think it's a beautiful sport. I do think it's really cool. I do love the 
aesthetic of the sport, you know, yeah. riders in, in mountainous areas and beautiful scenery. And that's part of the, that's my favourite thing about the sport is, is the scenery and the places it enables you to go to and, you know, that. And I just think that I worry that from the outside looking in, that when you've got things that are that ridiculous, yeah. it doesn't, it loses the... It stops being aspirational. So to someone who's like a young kid yeah. or, you know, thinking... Oh, or anyone oh, wanting to get into oh, cycling. What do I... Ah, oh, you know, you don't necessarily... Maybe you look at that and you think, weird. You don't think... Yeah. Oh, I'd, I, like to, I'd like to get into that. I think... Yeah. In, in, com, taken in context, you're going to go, well, it's a top-level piece of crazy equipment for the top 1% of the sport. Maybe even less than that. And then you feel like it's understandable and justifiable. But like you say, Tour de France, it's the biggest sport and event that maybe the world has, or certainly the cycling has. So everyone's going to watch it and they're going to look at it and go, do you know what? Maybe that's not for me. But we want cycling to be seen for everybody. Mm. Maybe this helmet is not the answer to that. I um, think, well, the other thing is it's, it's niche tech for, yeah, like you said, very high end. And no doubt it will have a very high price tag. And once again, it comes into that thing and we've got the olympics coming up later yeah. on this year of you know is there still a place for time trials in modern racing and i know that's a bigger topic god that's the whole separate take but it, show but it's it's you're, you're pricing out a lot of people and a lot of athletes by putting this huge barrier of super yeah. expensive tech up and also national federations from from um less economically developed countries yeah no, and, that's a totally and, valid point you know is there a, this you know and when it starts to look ridiculous as well yeah and it maybe the sport isn't as beautiful as it could be and well that is, surely is, is what's falling down partly to the UCI's rulings over various bits of tech and equipment that they deem to be acceptable or unacceptable it kind of seems weird that having your socks too high unacceptable having um, remember the Bianchi bike that la launched before with the little um, wind deflectors on mm. banned because you know fairing's not allowed but yeah. the, this helmet which seems to be utterly ridiculous yeah like really pushing the boundaries seems to be like thumbs up so far from the ECI yeah well I, there isn't really a limit on helmet size so it is in that way almost like a bit of a loophole but you would think that and there is a precedent for this, especially from the UCI in mountain biking, about preserving the aesthetic of the sport. That's yeah. why you have to have the frame double, like the, the, the diamond yeah. frame shape that we have. You can't have beam bikes because it has to preserve that aesthetic. But um, also in beam bikes less obtrusive than that helmet. Yeah, but in, but in mountain biking, you know, downhill, they, they're not allowed to wear skin suits because it yeah. has to preserve the aesthetic of that, that sport. And I think at some point you've, you've, you've maybe got to do that. Every, well, I think this is kind of where we drew a conclusion to this sort of subject before, is that everyone has got a limit on what they deem to be acceptable in terms of normality and pushing tech too far. Okay, our, so Our limit is probably a bit higher than most people's, but most people's is a relatively low threshold, I'd right. say. Right. So, so, okay, <coughs> right. So I'm worried when, I, when I wore the, the Met, which is still to a person in, on the street... It's still a ridiculous looking helmet. The giant Quite oversized. Yeah. Yeah. Because okay. I was wearing a size larger as well. Yeah. Um, in the in the Met um, drone. Drone TT helmet. Um, but that was saving me sort of seven to nine watts over the helmet that I used before. Yeah. So I'm like, absolutely, I'll take that. <laughs> so why you know, see where I'm going with this. So but how many watts does that Giro helmet have to save you for you to then, let's say in a in a ride in at yeah. 50k an hour. It needs to be for you to wear it. Um, I would want it to be 15. I, I want to say at least 10 watts more aerodynamically efficient to have the sacrifice of losing like the aesthetic take from it. Does that make sense? I'd want to, I'd want to be a significant gain, at least 10 watts. Otherwise, I'd be reverting to what I deem as like a normal looking time trial helmet. I'm going, to, I'm going to go a bit higher. I think if that was saving me 12 watts, <laughs> right, okay. You'd be over, okay what, over my current setup, yeah. if, it, if, it, if we tested it and it was 12 watts faster, then I'd be like, it's 12 watts. Okay, I'll throw it out I'd get, there. I'd be like, oh, I'll go to, I'll, okay, I'll do a time trial in that. You ride it, you, you're doing your local time trial at the weekend. It's like 10 miles from your house. You, you're like, oh, I could just ride there. Are you leaving your house that your neighbours can see with wearing a helmet he and riding oh. on a public road? I, I mean, I struggle to do that even with a normal TT helmet. Yeah. I mean, look, 
That's I what think, I drive. I drive to time trials. Put I, the think, <laughs> in the car. I think it's great for the top of the sport, pushing technical innovation. I think that's fine. I just don't want to see stuff like that trickling down into the everyday person's element. What about you? What's, what's your actual take on it? Bear in mind, this thought is coming from someone who wears an aero bra on a regular basis. Uh, I don't think it's going to save me 12 watts. But I don't know, maybe it would if we got it in the tunnel. It'd be good to get one in the tunnel and have a look, but yeah. I don't... I mean, if, it was, if it's saving me just a couple of watts, I, I'm not going to wear it. All right, fair. Um, is, that, is that wrapped up enough on the helmet? Yeah, we need to talk about uh, Podgy. Yeah. So, yeah, um, Tade Pogaccia, phenomenal like solo breakaway yeah. at Strada Bianchi. We were debating whether we could call it the best breakaway ever. Well, I think in the modern era, it's like the longest solo breakaway yeah. in, a, in, a, in, a, in a single day race. Yeah. Um, I think like Philippe Gilbert is second with his Flanders win, which was crazy. But um, it's, it's, it was massive. But I think what you want us to look at is some of the tech that he used and how yeah. that actually helped him. And there's a key piece that I want to draw in on here. So we know the weight of his bike and his setup yeah. because We've done videos on his bike before. Um, Side did one at the Tour de France last year, and he's using the exact same V4 RS Cornago, tricked out, right? It is tricked out. Yeah. Like, there's weight savings all over the place on it. So we know that it's 6.8 to 6.9 kilograms. It's usual for the mechanics to make it 6.9, just so that when the UCI weigh it, it's safe. The and you've got that margin. like 100 gram buffer zone for the inaccuracy of. The UCI scales. <laughs> if you think we'd have um, scales with accuracy better than 100 grams. <laughs> yeah, but there's just there's just like stuff like they're using like carbon tie chain rings, carbon tie rotors. Yeah, you know, like the carbon tie rotors. That's that's like, like 110 gram saving over Dura Ace rotors yeah. or XTR rotors. So that that's like a lot when you're talking like that's that's the difference between having a seven kilogram bike yeah. to six point nine to 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 a pro and they're they're gotcha, one of the teams like. which are going a little bit astray from mainstream like manufacturers and brands and sort of tweaking and you know, tuning their bike a little bit more because lots of teams kind of just go well that's what the manufacturer supplies that's what we just use it whereas mm. they're kind of going away and deviating a bit. but like I think it's it's great to see that that attention to detail like, yeah. we absolutely love it oh. And you know, one thing I don't know though, and I tried to find out, but I couldn't see anywhere, is if he was using a wax chain. But I, I, yeah. I'm willing to bet that he probably was. There's um, a couple of other like takeaway points though, which I think I know you're keen to talk about the tires because I think that's probably one of the most significant differences, right? Yeah. So you know, all right, his bikes on the UCI weight limit, and a lot of his competitors are, we know are over the UCI weight yeah. limit by like 300, 400 grams or whatever. But we know that weight isn't that's as crucial. significant as this next thing which you're saying tires, right? Yeah. So we can look at, we know what wheels the competitors are using. And the key thing is that he, he's using like the NV 4.5s. Yeah, which wide boys. A super wide, 25 millimeter internal hooked rim. And he's using 28 millimeter um, tires on there, or he may have been using 30s. Yeah. But it, he sort of had the option to use both, but they blow up huge. They are like big balloons on the wheels. Yeah, they're massive on that wide internal rim. Compare that to, say, Pidcock uh, or other Shimano sponsored teams. They were riding C36 Dura Ace wheels, 21, 21 mil internal yeah. width. And a lot of the wheels that the other guys, other teams are using are that sort of 21 mil internal width. And so if they're using the same width tie, you know, they were using 28s and 30s, they're not blowing up anywhere near as wide which means they're running them at higher pressure for the same tyre. And, and this is, there's a huge potential rolling resistance gain on yeah. the gravel. Isn't it? It's amplified on the gravel. This is the key thing. The rougher the surface, the yeah. more advantage is to be had by the wider the tyre, the lower the pressure. We've spoken about this in the past before. Generally, With Josh. Yeah, most people could benefit from having a wider tyre at a lower pressure. And if you're riding on a rough surface, you're going to get massive gains. Yeah, and so every time they're on gravel, He's finding it what you know several what, what's easier. Also, when he's one of the strongest, that's why he's riding away and vanishing. Yeah, 
<laughs> but then it's, you know, when you're attacking on those key sectors of gravel and stuff, that's important. And, th and it means he can hold his speed more when he yeah. like, goes down the descent and stuff. And we're not justifying his win based purely on this. We're just saying it's undoubtedly a contributing factor. Yeah. Plus, when you look at the aero of the wheels, when you're putting those big tires on, yeah. it's, they're, not they're not as optimal around, you know, with a 21 mil internal channel, it's not as good with a 28 or a 30 mil tire on it aerodynamically. Yeah. Whereas those... <clears throat> The wheels that he's got on being so wide, they are much aerodynamically better with the wider tire. I mean, Pagacha's setup in general is one of the most dialed in setups. I'm not specifically talking about individual brands and products, but think about his body position, the fact that he's always someone that's using proper narrow handlebars, used the aero helmet, don't very often see him use an aero helmet. Mm. You know, he's got all of that thinking stuff about tricked it. out. Yeah. Thinking about it. What, the reason I think it's probably the best breakaway ever is because he literally said, I'm going to attack at this point. Everyone knew what he had said, and he did that. And, and he left vanished. his and he left his saddlebag on. Oh, saddle! I crucially, I wish I knew what he had in the saddlebag. If any anyone, but let us know your thoughts in the comments. What you think was in Pagacha's saddlebag, and we'll read the best one out next week. You can have complete speculation in there. Yeah, it? Could, it could literally be anything. Also, I forgot. Jammy to, Dodgers. I forgot to say earlier on that um, the worst thing about the big big helmet. Yeah. We can't take we can't take the mick out of triathletes anymore, can we? <laughs> triathletes will love this. Do you reckon those triathletes have got their hands on it yet? Probably. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. Um, all right. Yeah. So do share your thoughts on the helmet and uh, Pogacha's right. saddlebag situation. In the Time course. now for hot tech. Yeah. Right. Hot tech changes in hot tech. Did I see last week there is now a tool of the week segment that appeared while I was gone? It, it's not. It's not. It's not each week, but it's going. It's going to be a all recurring right. segment. Yeah. It's good, I like it, innovative. Mm. Also, I'm slightly upset that you discussed those oil slick um, seabed ceramic pulley wheels without <laughs> me. I knew you'd like those. Yeah, I loved them. Yeah. Well, um, unfortunately, I haven't seen any oil slick stuff this week, but mm. we'll keep an eye out. <laughs> uh, what we do have, though, yeah. are some new power meter pedals yeah. from Look. Mm. Now, this is pretty exciting. Like, power meter pedals are hugely popular. Uh, segment of the power meter market. Um, so they've got two new ones out. They've got um, a new Look Keo blade power meter pedal, mm -hmm. and an X-Track power meter pedal. So that's their off-road gravel mountain bike. Oh, pedal. yeah, yeah, that makes a sense. Clipping pedal. Like an, like a, it uses the same cleat as a Shimano uh, yeah. SPD. Um, the, the crucial thing with these is they have the same stack height um, as a normal Kia yeah, Blade okay, pedal. Yeah, that's good, yeah. And same Q factor. Also, so yeah. they're not like super big high stack height and they're not slightly wider, you know, spacing your legs apart, yeah. which is um, something that some power meter pedals do in order to incorporate all the gubbins. Electrical wizardry. Yeah. Um, <laughs> they're available single or dual sided yeah. and said to be plus or minus 1%. According it's kind of like look. a standard accuracy across the... Yeah. yeah. Um, and they're just 260 grams a pair for the road set, so that's pretty light for pedals, let alone power meter pedals. Yeah. Like, it's pretty good. Um, and the mountain bike ones are a bit heavier, 404 grams. They have a 60-hour battery, USB-C charging, yeah. and you want to know the prices, right? Of course I want to know the prices. So you're looking at <laughs> 900 uh, quid, or around 1,000 euros and dollars, for the dual-sided. Yeah. The single-sided is 600 um, quid, or 700 euros and dollars. Power meters are just not necessarily a cheap thing, are they? No. That's just how it goes. Um, right, also, um, I mentioned new bikes at the start of the show, mm -hmm. didn't I? One of those being the Canyon Grizzle On. So Canyon have just launched a new e-bike, and I'm mindful that we've been talking a lot about e-bikes recently on tech and GCN. Some people still get annoyed about e-bikes. So e yeah, don't get annoyed about it, but I've got some information for you here anyway. So, um, yeah, e-bikes are kind of here to stay. I yeah. think they're great, but whatever. This is the Canyon Grizzle On. It's using the Bosch... SX line motor, which is a crank-based system, 400, um, 400 watt-hour battery, plus there's a 250 watt-hour bolt-on battery booster, right? So the big difference here is it's kind of like an e-gravel bike, but across the range they've all got a suspension fork. Yeah? Mm. You sort of sold on that idea or not? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's cool. So Canyon is saying that um, 
they kind of like turned the Grizzle up a level and they've involved the engineers to design it, which have worked across their e-mounted bike platform. So it's not like you've just got the original Grizzle and they've slapped a motor on there. They've worked with the e-mounted bike team to sort of redesign the bike. And in essence, what they've done is kind of like slacken the head tube and slacken the seat tube a little bit to make it a little bit more stable and just change the handling characteristics of it a little bit. Mm -hmm. Which I think is cool. Um, you've got integrated lights, you've got separate bar and stem, you've got a neat little storage solution which you can remove. Um, and I think, let me count, one, two, three, four, four different options. So you've got a Canyon on CF Trail, a CF9, a CF Daily, and a CF7. Do you want to know weights and prices? Please say yes, because I've got them ready to go. Hit me. Um, weights start at 15.3 kilograms for the CF9, and prices start at 4,999 euros for the CF7. They look very smart. They do look smart, I like yeah. that. Um, um, oh, we need to grab the bags. We haven't got the bags. Uh, we have some nice new bags from Silka now. Ooh. I mean, Silka make lovely products, full stop. And they've been making seat packs and saddle bags for a while, which a lot of people swear by. They've got some bigger bags now called Grinter. Um, and they've got a bar bag and they've got a seat pack. One of the sort of key features on here is that it has bow dials on it to close it and open it and also strap it onto your bike. That's a nice detail. Which is a neat detail. Yeah. Um, but this Grinter saddle pack, is um, it's either two or five liters, depending on how you pack it. And the cool feature that enables that, and I've not seen this on a saddlebag before, so okay. excuse me if you have, um, is it has an air bleed valve. So this air bleed valve allows you to like suck out all of the unnecessary air while tightening the boa. So that uh, yeah, you can yeah. make, so it's not got any excess bulk. It's it's just got is, the, so it's got this roll top design, which helps make it like waterproof and like like welded seams and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah, I mean, it's it's you can just it's really really well made. The thing nice. that I found interesting is um, I was reading the Silka sort of article about it. It says due to the way it's constructed, like internally, it means it helps give it like some support. So you yeah. haven't got like this saddlebag swinging yeah. around behind the, you. The way that the boa dial is, is is sort of holding everything together and the frame inside. Anyone that's ridden with a large pack on the back of their bike yeah. will know what we say when you want to avoid having that like pendulum <laughs> yeah. effect when you ride, and so it's designed to stop that. Not all seat packs do that, thankfully. And well, I like the bar bag. About it. Now that I've sort of admitted in videos that I do like bar bags yeah. a little bit, I, I've got a lot of time for this one. Sort of nicely constructed little bit of kit. This. Yeah. Put all your gravel snacks and accessories in there. Yeah, plenty of space in there. Right, what do we have next? <clears throat> right, it's the second, um, let me carefully put that down there. It's the second bike which I promised at the start of the show. Okay. Um, guys, hear me out, it's an e-bike And you are, you, <laughs> right. This is things that we associate with Alex, having drawers full of discarded Jura Ace crank sets <laughs> and e-bikes uh, and lube. It wouldn't fit in a Carry drawer. On. Um, the, the cranks, not the loop. Um, yeah. Too many cranks, so it's more of a cupboard. Yeah. Um, right. The Orbea DM uh, cool. is launching this week. Mm. We have a detailed video all about it, which is over on GCN. Size done, which is actually similar to the Grail on, where we've got a video all about that. So it's, a, it's almost like a super commuter e-bike. Hear me out. It's a really cool looking thing. We'll have a picture for you now. Um, it's made using a hydroformed aluminium frame, because I think many people will look at it and assume it's carbon fiber. I thought it was carbon. I know, I did the first I did first time as well. So I double and then triple checked, and it's definitely hydroformed aluminium with a carbon fiber fork. Um, so it's using the Shimano EP801 motor, belt drive, and it also has auto shifting gears in the rear hub, which is like uber level commuter sort of tech. Uh, I mean, it's kind of like, it's what you want if you're commuting in the, all of the rubbish sort of weather and stuff like that. Right, prices, 3,499 up to 5,299 pounds. So it is a bike for people that are going to be taking commuting like very seriously. A um, couple of little bit more information here. We've got, um, this was a neat detail, but probably not one that everyone's going to be shouting about. There's a little hidden cover on the frame where you can then hide an air tag or like a compatible tracker device in it. I mean, you don't want your £5,000 e-bike going walkabouts, do you? Definitely not. <laughs> um, right, also I've done some calculations. So there's options of a 540 watt hour battery or a 630 watt hour battery with a claimed range of up to 150 kilometers. And also there's a battery extender so you can add another 250 watt hours of battery in, which means by my rough calculations, 
you technically could do a 200 kilometer commute on this bike, spend your day at work, charge it all back up, 200 kilometers back home again if you were, yeah. if you so wanted to. I've done the maths. I think it's possible in a nine to five job. You're yeah, just going to yeah. have a pacey ride on the way home. That's good. I like. It. I love the range extenders. Um, um, next up, we're going to talk about uh, hookless. Yeah. Right. right. And the reason is, okay, there's some comments under last week's show that accused us of being in the covert, you know, Illuminati cycling global cabal. It happens. Play the graphic. So much so we've got a graphic, mate. And the reason why they were accusing us of that is because we didn't talk about the, the hookless drama that's been happening. Yeah. But the reason why is because by the time we made the show, we <clears> felt <throat> that that was kind of old news and a lot of people had discussed it. And we'd done a big story up on our website on globalcyclingnetwork.com about it. So we weren't avoiding it. We just, yeah, that's where it is. But to, well, further proof to that, there's been developments yeah, well, which we're now going to talk about. So, um, first thing, I spotted at uh, Strada Bianca, going yeah. back to that briefly, yeah. um, Gerard Gruber, the fantastic photographer, he did a post on Instagram where he actually had, had, took a picture of one of the, the riders who appeared to have that same tyre runoff problem. Um, and you can see the insert and the tyre have come off yeah. um, after a puncture, presumably. So again, that's happened again. And, and then there's also been a development from the CPA, the Riders Association, um, there's which lots is headed of, by uh, Adam Hansen. Yeah, there's lots of, well, like you say, you didn't speak about it last week, but since then, I feel like there's been more information and, crucially, um, statements released by various brands which are kind of like associated to this. Um, shall we sort of skim hitters. through some hitters, of Hitters, Alex. I'm mindful, I'm mindful there's a lot of statements. So the CPA um, president, Adam Hansen, said the following. The crash is why the CPA are 100% against hookless rims. Tires should not come off the rim. The maximum PSI these hookless tires can have put in them is 73. And if you hit something, it for sure goes above the maximum 73 PSI rating on impact. And that's why tires are coming off. So that's what he had to say about mm. it. Quite strong worded to say CPA 100% against hookless rims. Yeah. Um, Vittoria um, have also released a statement. They're blaming a rock that they crashed into. Um, they say it's crucial to clarify that the rim's failure resulted from an impact with an object, in this case, a rock, and is unrelated to the hookless rim design. The intensity of the impact caused the rim and wheel to break in a manner that prevented the tyre from staying securely in place. Um, <clears throat> there's a little bit more, but we don't need to go into all those details. And then Zip have also released a statement, and they say they do extensive testing, both to existing industry ratified standards, as well as their own protocols based on over 30 years of designing the fastest wheels on the planet. Mm -hmm. The test includes both traditional impact tests for the rim, as well as the retention tests for specific tire and rim combinations. Basically, it feels like everyone's saying conflicting things, it seems to appear that it's the result of a huge impact from a rock. Yeah. And I mean, it, smash a rock into anything, it's going to break, right? Yeah, we don't know, <laughs> but I mean, as more details emerge within this sort of story and in this space, yeah, rest it's assured gonna, it's gonna we're going to talk about them here. Um, I mean, one of the things is as well, like, and I'm going to get accused of being part of the cabal here, right? I got accused of much hatred about hookless. So I don't, I don't run hookless. Putting that out there. Yeah, okay. I, you know, so, you know, there's instances where I wouldn't want to run a 25mm tyre mm -hmm. in time trials on very, very fast, smooth surfaces where I would want, uh, you know, that higher kind of pressure. That doesn't work for Doesn't that work instance. for me, no. Um, but, but irrespective of that, just in giving some balance to it, yeah. some balance to the force, Yeah. people rolled tubular tyres off tubular rims yeah. for years. And, 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 you know, people had bad crashes on descents, you know, when a tub rolled off. Chris Froome had a bad uh, crash when he rolled a tub once. I think in one of the, this is a subject which we could probably go on for hours and hours. But I, my take on it, for whatever it's worth, because it's not an educated take, because I haven't seen all the individuals mm. in this case, is, but hookers in general, if you adhere to the correct standards and regulations that are all clearly listed out, you should, in theory, have no issues you run into, because it's all rigorously tested. Now... Like any technology, I feel like if it's deviated from in terms of its use case or exceeding any of the tolerances, then that's when you run into issues. We've yeah. had it in races in the past. We've seen broken handlebars. We've seen broken forks. You know, and no one's then going ban carbon fibre. Mm. I think 
nine times out of ten, not always the case, it often falls down to like human error or a freak accident. I don't know. Cool. Right, that's enough hot tech. Into comments of the week. Um, so, from last week's show, first thing I want to say, that bell ring was absolutely out of this world. My, my ears are still ringing. I just, God. You've got um, a lot to live up to. We're all ringing this week. Yeah, I better find. I don't even know where the bell is, actually. Got, What's John done with it? Noob Cyclist says <sighs> Since John is here, the hookless blowout on the Pro t Peloton can be a good topic. Oh, sorry. Please re re reserve that for when Alex returns. Well, we're back, so that's, well, why that's we what we've done. It. Robert, F Robert Tell says yeah. What uh, if the sliding weight scale is based off height? It correlates to the weight of the rider, but no benefit to trying to lose weight just for weighing. Yeah, so I mean, it's a really interesting subject you guys were speaking about last week. <sighs> I don't think a sliding scale is going to work. Nah. There's no. lots of ways that I think were the best ways of going about it, but I think it's So that's with regards to uh, the weight of bikes, basically, and the minimum weight limit, which yeah. I explained to people who didn't see last week's show, but yeah. I don't know how you're ever going to go about it in a practical sense. Yeah, it's difficult without to Without causing like, issues and, yeah. yeah. Um, underneath the heart rate versus power video that we had out at the weekend, um, Brother Michigan says, pause the video at 8.01 when my five-year-old walked into the room. He then looked at Ollie and said, I like that guy, he's stylish. No one's ever called me stylish before. Well, unless people did when we were asked them about the cool cyclist. Well, uh, he looks a bit goofy. Yeah, uh, well, I'll tell you what, um, I mean, Brother Michigan, sorry about this, but you might want to get your you know, child checked to see if they have cataracts. <laughs> I was not expecting that. Okay. Just saying. Okay, um, anyway. Next question. Kwa Rock says, uh, you, you know, you, you should do calories burned off. So this was on our heart rate versus power video. Yeah. It says you should do calories burned with heart rate versus power. Um, I went down a rabbit hole of trying to figure this out uh, for proper nutrition and weight loss. Okay, so yeah, um, well in terms of the amount of energy expenditure you have on a bike, yeah, yeah, like using a power meter is a much more accurate, accurate way than yeah. using a heart rate for sure. Definitely. Maybe we should do a future video on it. Yeah. Uh, underneath the chain video where I did a deep dive with uh, Adam from Zero Friction Cycling, and it was a deep dive, oh boy, you had to be in it for the long run with that one. Um, Easter Lake says, I don't really see waxing in the immediate future. I'd love to hear suggestions on dry lube or drip on wax recommendations. I think waxing is kind of like here to stay. Yeah, no, but yeah. this person, I think, is talking about what they're going to do. And okay. I would say... Yeah, like if you want to, it's a great first step to get into it. I'd say the first thing to do is when you buy your new chain, strip it. Yeah. So you get all that horrible factory grease off, which you can do with the like chain stripper in a jar. It's easy yeah. to do. And then just bang on the drip on uh, wax lube and use the Silka Super Secret. I actually use great. the drip on wax lube like 99% of the time because I'm like a bit lazy and like immersive. Well, I mean, like, like Josh was saying, what yeah. the, the difference is like one and a half watts or yeah. something. Yeah. It's like you're giving up like a one and a half watts of like peak performance, but yeah. convenience, weigh it up. Don't worry about it. Use the new time trial. Yeah. Uh, Doug Pence <laughs> says, what is the cause of chain stretching? You know, why do chains like stretch? Um, and how does you know keeping it lubricated? Stop well, this the is a common misconception, right? Everyone, not everyone, lots of people think a chain stretching is literally the plates elongating, but that's not the case. Mm. The chain stretch is increasing the distance between the pins purely on the basis of the wearing, away. The wearing on the pins. I'm going to do this thing. I mean, like trigger warning for some of you watching this now. I know what's coming. I you know, know what's coming, don't you? I'm yeah. going to do this thing with my my hands and my fingers, just. Brace yourselves. Just demonstrate it. Demonstrate okay, it. So this is a roller. Yeah. This is a pin. Yeah. Now when the chain is like new, yeah. it's like this. Yeah. Okay? But then as it wears, it's like this and it can it's stretch. That's the stretch. It's like there's play, yeah? Yeah, it's play, yeah. Wear. Yeah. Jacob's cracking off over there. Okay. Jacob, hold it together. Come on, we're yeah. all adults. Hold it together. We're talking about chains, girl. Okay, so maybe we should actually do a deep dive into like some really cool graphics and highlight that without. Why do we need yeah. graphics? I've just yeah. perfectly demonstrated it right. with my hands. Okay, moving swiftly, very swiftly on from that. <laughs> it's time for comment. It's time for the bike vault. Hold it together. Yeah, oh, God, I'm nearly crying. 
big pride. Um, it's time for the bike vault. You can upload your pictures using the uploader. The link is in the description of the videos. And um, well, then we pick them out, judge them for either nice or super nice. Right, first up this week, we've got Gleb with their Cannondale Super 6 Evo 2022, and they're in Brooklyn. What do you make of that? I was in Brooklyn last week, didn't see this. Um, are, they, are those carbon tie chain rings on there? Yeah, they are. Oh. I really like that. Oh, super nice. Super nice. No, yeah. Chris yeah, next with the it. Cannondale CAD 8 with 10 speed 105. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Love this as well. Valves are aligned. Slightly upsetting that there's a dust cap on the back valve but not the front wheel, but we can let that go. The saddle is very low, but I'm yeah. gonna go super nice. Yeah, super nice. Uh, John, more ha John has a Colnago Master in Minnesota, Eden Prairie. I've, I've, I've never been to Eden Prairie, but it looks like a wall rather than a, a prairie. <laughs> That's awful. This bike's nice, I like it. Yeah? Um, let me get a closer look. That's, that's some, there's some big slabs on that wall. Yeah, time efficient for building. I like this, really cool. Yeah. Um, I'm not a fan of that saddle, but the bike overall, super nice, yeah? Go on then. Go on. He um, he. He he. Trekamonda. Wind space wheels on it. Mm, and SRAM uh, ETAP access. And this is in their home. They're Very not saying, dark. They're not saying where it is in their home. Um, but the garden. it's been done on a budget, right? So frame and wheel set were bought on eBay for 900 quid. Yeah. And then they've like upgraded it with some other bits. So it's wind space wheels on there and then some other bits, they've spent about 400 quid on it. That's so amazing, for, for like, <clears throat> Yeah, uh, as, a, as, a, as a sort of high performance bike on a budget, loving it. Fantastic way to go about it. It's that. underexposed. Significantly. Um, <laughs> it's pretty dark. It would be nice to have a bit of brightness in the image so you can my, actually see what's going on. My laptop brightness is on max capacity. Yeah, me too. It's, it's fixed it a little bit. Okay, uh, I think we can we can super nice that, but you need to jet wash your, your little cobbled paving. <laughs> Advice on gardening. Um, Adam with a Colnago Master Saronin. Another one. Yeah. Um, in Cleveland, Ohio. That, this is incredible, this bike. <laughs> Look at it! Yeah. Oh, I think I'm in love with this bike. Please tell right. me you like this. Modern group set on a retro build. Sign me up. Ta yeah. Literally, literally take my money. I'm into it. <laughs> take my money. I'm, now. I'm into it too. Should I read out my credit card number? <laughs> I, I, I think this. I, I mean, the only thing that I, I wouldn't super nice it for is that crap little twig <laughs> that he's got yeah. propping it up. <clears throat> Yeah, I get okay, a shadow on. stand, man. Or some sort of, yeah. Available from Shoplot Global Cycling Network. I mean, this is nice. I mean, oh, I love that. Modern Campagnolo group set on an old school bike. That's what dreams are made of. Super I like nice. the machine. I just want to point out one detail I so like. So I could hear you. The, super the nice machined it. alloy out front computer mount, which matches the bar and stem. Yeah. And the. Alloy spaces, it's really It's a nice. dream for me. Right, last bike of this week's show is from Harley. It's a Ribble CGR Tie 125 with, um, I'm presuming this is a custom paint job. Oh, and very, very deep, deep wheels. <laughs> deep boy rear. Flat That's pedals, my, flat pedals Flat though. pedals. Do you know what? That custom paint job is really, really cool, isn't it? That like green on there, I really like that. I really like it. Can uh, I, can it's I just say one thing that I, I feel like I don't want to, it's going to maybe be, seem rude if you really love this bike. Do you not think the little lines of the yellowy next to the green reminds you of that sort of electrical tape sort of design? Yes, it does look I'm like. Really sorry to say. What's that. the theme of your paint, your custom paint? It's like oh, an earth, electrical it's like earth tape. table tape. Yeah. <laughs> no, um, I do really like it though. Can um, we super nice I, that's it? That's also, I, that single? is my, right, this will, this, will, this will set some people off. That's my favourite Jura Ace crank set of all time. That one. Yeah, I'm kind of that group set in general is the one for me. I like That's that. my favourite like that one. That one. I think yeah. it's the nicest looking one. I don't have anyway, any of those ones laying around. Um, super nice. <laughs> Although it's weird that there's that like Zip 808 encroaching in on the left. God damn it. But whatever, that's a clean sweep of super nice is. Has it? that ever happened before? Don't know. Don't know, you heard it here first. There you go. Um, that's this week's show, drawn to a close. I'm glad to be back. Um, thanks for having me back. 
It's been nice. Yeah. Kind of holiday. Good to have you back, man. Yeah. Hope thanks. you enjoyed the show. Like, subscribe, blah, 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 blah. See you in the next one. Love you. Bye. <laughs> Love you. Bye.